I'm at the start of a journey across America to find out some 10 years after these crops were introduced whether they are working, whether they are cost effective and their environmental impact. <laughs> My main role in life is as a conventional livestock family farmer from Cornwall, but I'm also a family farms campaigner. I've seen the development of herbicide tolerant and insect resistant crops since their introduction, and as a UK farmer, I also know there is a huge pressure to allow the growing of GM crops in the UK and Europe. Hi. Hi. You must be Mike. That's right. You sprayed this the last day or two? About three days ago I sprayed this. These are Roundup Ready sugar beets. I've discovered I got a problem out here, and that is these this, are not dying. Th this is a new weed for us. Um, what that is is that's Roundup Ready canola, and Roundup Ready canola isn't growing anywhere in this region. In the springtime, oh, we have huge flocks of geese that land in these fields as they're coming out of Canada in the fall, and then yeah. of course in the spring, you know, they come back. But I think in the fall, when in they're the coming fall, from they've Canada, fed on the canola up there. They're eating canola up in passing Canada, passing through them, and then dropped here on the. Yep. There's nothing that kills this out of sugar beets. And so I, I called Monsanto and asked them what I could do about it. They told me uh, hand labor was the only way to get rid of it. One plant uh, can have hundreds of thousands of seeds on it. And uh, if that goes to seed, we're, then uh, we'll be dealing with it much sooner and it'd be a much bigger problem. You probably don't know about this yet over in Europe, but Monsanto actually was granted a patent on tank mixing. It's just the process of mixing chemicals together. They know that we're going to have these problems, and they know it's going to take tank mixes of other chemicals with Roundup to control this sort of a problem. And uh, also, of course, you know, our weeds are becoming resistant to Roundup, so we're having to tank mix other chemicals in to yeah. control those problem weeds. We've just relied too heavily on Roundup is what's happened, and everybody's been using it in every crop and the weeds are really quickly adapting and, and becoming immune. When Roundup Ready crops started to get introduced here back in the mid-90s, uh, as far back as the early 90s, uh, most of these chemical companies stopped putting research into uh, developing new uh, conventional herbicides because they thought everything's going to be Roundup Ready, there won't be a market for this stuff, we're not going to put any money into development. So here we are, you know, 25 years later, and uh, or roughly, and uh, We've got this problem. We don't have any herbicides to control some of these weeds, and uh, we're relying on Roundup, and we're starting to have a real mess. The last years that I was growing conventional soybeans, I was trying to grow for Japan, yeah. uh, and uh, we were exporting them over there, and they wanted to have uh, pure non-GMO soybeans. And what happened was uh, our beans kept becoming more and more contaminated, and uh, it was getting down to the point where about 50% of our loads were being rejected because of contamination. Mm. And we couldn't buy seed that was pure without contamination. The seed company sold us straight up. This stuff's going to have some contamination in it. Yep. And uh, so, and on top of that, um, the conventional seed no longer was cheap. The seed companies, because the Roundup Ready seed was five or six times as much money, they simply hiked the price on their conventional seed and then when they sold you the seed, it came with a clause that even though it's conventional, it's not patented, you couldn't save and replant it. So we were back to paying the high price for the conventional seed. We couldn't sell it into the Japanese market for a premium. We were putting then more expensive conventional herbicides on it. It was a losing proposition. We didn't have any choice but to go back and start planting Roundup Ready crops. There was, there was no choice. That was the only choice. You're trapped into a, a, a pattern that you right. can't get out of. Right. So now we're growing soybeans that uh, instead of paying six or seven or eight dollars a bushel for seed, um, we're paying uh, uh, in the 50 to 60 dollars a bushel for the seed. Monsanto had what they call, because the price of the seed is so expensive, uh, they were justifying that with what they call their rewards program. So in other words, uh, if the crop freezes off, if it blows out in the wind, if it floods out in the flood or something like that, they'll supply you with uh, uh, another round of seed at a discounted price or or to re to reseed the they, they'll help yeah. you to replant um, if you're going to use a generic um, then uh, you're on your own you're, you're on your own right so um, that 
that was supposed to come with the high price of the seed, but not, so in other words, they're kind of forcing you to use their chemical yeah. because it's sort of an insurance policy. They've given you, you a freedom, a but a freedom with a, with a lot of buts. Right. You know, a lot of clauses that mean you, you're still, in a way, trapped into, into using their products as well as their seed. Right. It becomes one of those things where you have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages yeah. of not using their product, and uh, it's a way to entice you to use their product is what it is. Yeah. As I drove north to meet another farmer, I thought about what Rodney had said. It seemed crazy to me that he had to resort to hand labor as the only way to control the GM canola that was growing in his crops. In North Dakota, we had a, um, a whole coexistence um, panel and a coexistence, um, trying to think of what one would call it, <laughs> uh, a tr sort of a a trial run at trying to understand if there could be coexistence. It, it, it was deemed not possible. No matter how careful one might be in segregating every aspect of production from seed production and development through marketing of the commercial supply, right. even if one could achieve that, which I don't think is possible, not economically anyway. Uh, the pollen ish drift issue is the cross-pollination issue is, is unsolvable. So a, a distance of 40 yards, which is what the European Union is talking about, you would... You would <laughs> I can tell by the smile that <laughs> you think that is completely well, ridiculous. Um, um, I, guess, I guess the, the serious consideration of, of, of buffer zones was, was given up in this country quite a long time ago. Issues such as uh, pharmaceutical rice was one that was brought up in Missouri yeah. and um, not too long ago. And, and the company that was contemplating the, the field tests of that moved it from Missouri, a thousand miles to North Carolina, where no rice had been grown, would be grown for several hundreds of miles. Yeah. So that is the type of, of um, distances that we're talking now. I headed south through South Dakota into Iowa and continued south just into Missouri before turning west over the Missouri River into Brownville, Nebraska. Here I hope to meet a farmer called Corky Jones who farms 3,000 acres of GM maize and soybeans. Uh, this was uh, maize and was planted about the first week in May. And after it was planted, before it emerges, we put a pre-emergence spray on this of chemicals yep. to hold down the grass and the weeds which uh, about two weeks later or three weeks later, uh, we come back with gramoxin over the top of that. Right. So it's a two-fold shot. Neither one of them work 100% by their sales, but it's a, it's a double deal. If we just waited to have the weeds emerging and going to come in with glyphosate, you're going to cut way back the yield. So this had a, a, a residual herbicide on before sowing, it had a gramoxone on before you sowed, Yep. and then it's had a roundup since. Right, you right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that appears to have now effectively the combination of those it, one, it, two, three It's expensive, three sprays, but, uh, that, but it's done uh, the trick. Yes, yeah. And we've heard the single pass, you know, for so long. Well, you won't hear that from an actual producing farmer. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he knows by now that that's a, a fallacy, yeah. To me, the logic says, well, okay, the system maybe worked for a few years, and now it, it doesn't. You know, you're having to spray more, um, the seed's costing more. You know, how come American farmers haven't gone, okay, fine, let's go back to conventional and conventional spraying patterns? I mean, if you're using the conventional sprays that would work on any crop of corn or mm -hmm. any crop of beans. The know, seed companies have dropped the research into, into conventional. They're holding this. So it's, it's a, availability of, of non-GM seeds. Right, is right. The, is the crucial factor here. That is right, that is right. After leaving Corky's, I headed east back into Missouri to meet Roger Allison, a very unusual farmer in today's American agriculture as he grows non-GM crops. We're in, in soybeans, but these are non-GM soybeans. Yeah, this is a public variety soybean. Um, 
the name is Will Cross and that uh, it's, a, it's not a GMO. It's a non-GMO soybean. So just take me through, you, you cultivated this, you don't put on any pre-emergence herbicide? We don't do any burn down, don't no. Don't do any burn down, you just spray for the weeds once the crop is in the right condition and, and able to do it. Yes. And then that's it, so it's, it is one pass. It, you know, basically, uh, I mean, it, it, basically with our herbicide, you know, it is, you know, uh, one pass, and then if the conditions are right, if we have enough moisture, and we get the canopy, um, and then that that normally stops the the weed growth if you've got a good population. Now, you know, we've had years where the population, because of the weather, or because of disease, or because of insects, you know, it's been a little bit lower, and so you wind up with a little bit more weeds. Okay. Uh, but it's just like any other crop that a farmer does. Sometimes those, you know, there's variables that are out there. Sometimes the condition means you have more weeds and sometimes you get none. So. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and they said, well, the reason we want to do, uh, you need to do GMOs is one pass, it's cheaper, gets all the weeds, um, and that hasn't been the case. And, uh, you know, we've wound up with weeds that, you know, our super weeds right now, we work with a, you know, a young farmer and that uh, he's combined our crops uh, mm -hmm. and then I haul away from the combine. Mm -hmm. And it's worked out, you know, pretty well for us, but he also does custom combining for, oh. you know, a lot of other farmers. And that, so these weeds get passed around um, because you can't get your combine clean enough uh, to, to, you know, to say that, you know, it, it's it, that combine. You never get it free. as clean as it was when it came out of the factory. Absolutely not. There's just no way. Do you have any problem with weed control? Um, I mean, and, and do, are the herbicides available for you for use in, a, in these crops? Well, one of the things on, like, a public variety that's not a GMO, um, the land-grant universities, they're not doing any uh, research. Uh, or they're not trying to uh, buy uh, plant breeding, you know, to make a better public variety mm -hmm. bean. All of that has gone to um, a, a patented seed owned by a corporation, uh, and the universities are doing that work for them. Uh, and it's the same way with herbicides. You know, uh, there hasn't been, you know, the ongoing Not the research, uh, research into, uh, you know, different types of, uh, of herbicides. But because uh, Roundup is failing uh, to provide, uh, you know, weed protection uh, for these soybeans, there's a little bit, you know, that's going on now. And maybe, um, maybe the public varieties, uh, you know, will be able to use some of those. Do you have any problem? getting the seed? I mean, you, I presume you save your own? Now this year, we started, you know, fresh. Uh, we didn't uh, hold back any seed. You know, we brought in... So it's all new seed this uh, year? We brought in uh, a whole new seed. We had planted several varieties last year, and that um, uh, this variety, uh, this will cross, uh, we wanted, we will save seed from, from it. Even though uh, the uh, professional seed cleaners uh, are under threat from Monsanto about, um, you know, cleaning soybeans uh, because Monsanto's got a patent on Roundup Ready soybeans and that uh, they very aggressively, you know, pursue that. They notify all the seed uh, cleaners uh, uh, about, you know, not cleaning uh, Roundup Ready, so, uh, but they will clean a public variety mm -hmm. Uh, public variety seed. And now the cost uh, of this seed, it costs us $21.50 for a 50 pound bag. Right. For uh, Roundup, um, I think the best was about thirty-two fifty that I knew mm -hmm. of uh, farmers around here that, that they had bought. And so you can see there's quite a bit uh, of difference there. And then the other difference really comes in is when I save my seed next year and I plant it, uh, I'm going to have, you know, the market price of the seed basically, you know, in that, and which will be, you know, probably half of the 2150 maybe $10, $10 if we're lucky.
uh, and it doesn't fall to five uh, dollars a bushel. What would you recommend to me as a, a UK farmer and to other European farmers? Should we go down the route of, of genetically modified crops or, or is it something you think we should avoid doing? Well, I would say, you know, at all costs, avoid doing it. That evening, I had a phone call from someone I would call Joe, not his real name. He had heard about the film I was making on GM crops from one of the farmers I'd met on my journey. After talking to him for some time, he agreed to do an interview for the film about his experience as someone involved. His identity has been hidden because of his work. Uh, when glyphosate was patented, uh, still on patent, and, and at first the, the soybean system was introduced, it, it cost a farmer about $20 for a quart of glyphosate. And then as we had to start using more than a quart, it came down to about 15 and then down to about $10 an acre. So and it didn't matter if you were throwing a bit more on, the cost hadn't risen. Ex exactly, yeah, and, and, and it stayed about there. And then when, it came, when glyphosate came off patent, then, then the, the market uh, crashed in it and it, it got down to three or four dollars an acre and that's when everybody really switched over uh, because it got so cheap and then once once they had everybody switched over um, uh, the companies went and controlled controlled the glyphosate market and now we're back up to ten or twelve dollars an acre once they've got it once they've so got the, everybody the, the, trapped the companies have controlled the ingredients the ingredients that, that go into glyphosate that's right and in order and and, and, and having done that they can then manipulate the price exactly having so, the farmers in the system mm -hmm. right. so so exactly. if you're in the if you're in the business of making uh, of selling a non-branded glyphosate or a generic glyphosate uh, you really don't have a choice because you have to buy the you have to buy your acid from the from the controlling company and they'll just they raise the price of the acid to to make it so that uh, the the price of the end product uh, goes up and on the seed side um, we used to uh, think a hundred dollars for a bag of corn uh, was quite a bit of money. How, how much would a bag seed? How many? Th th this year, the list price on a bag of oh, a bag of corn will do area, three. Yeah. We'll do th we'll do about three acres. So yeah. Yep. So it was about used to be about thirty dollars an acre, and now we're uh, we're paying about three hundred dollars. So now it's about a hundred dollars an so it's, acre. It's tripled in price. In yeah, in in two years. years. Once once this all happened, all research and and technology on any other herbicides just completely came to a halt. So if the system gets to the point where it's at now and if it, if it continues to deteriorate where it doesn't control the problem weeds that we have, there hasn't been any research and development hardly done on any new products for 10 years. So we don't have alternatives. You don't have alternatives once it fails. Other than to put on even more glyphosate even put on and more. hope that that'll yeah, work. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Let's pour it on with a, yeah. with a jug rather than spray it on That's there, right. You know. mm -hmm. On the BT side, on the, on the, the insect, mm -hmm insecticide that's, that's built in in the, the genetic modification. A number of farmers have said to me, well, we really didn't have a problem with, with European corn borer before. Right, and corn rootworms. And, and so, but we, we've gone, then we, we don't have a problem. But, uh, you know, one guy, for instance, said that, you know, in the last 30 years, he'd had one year when it had been a, a real problem. Mm -hmm. now, yep. Is that the case? So, you know, is there any real need for you know the 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 European corn borer protection uh, was sure handy and it was nice because uh, it wasn't much fun scouting for European corn borers when you know in the middle of the summer. Um, but I agree that the population of them it was a one in ten year deal where they were bad enough that they created a lot of yield damage. Um, the corn rootworm protection is probably a bigger waste of time and and has been forced down farmers throats um, probably more so um, because that only generally occurs uh, on a corn on corn on corn you know situation and the majority of the acres are, are rotated either corn soybeans or corn wheat soybeans and uh, which takes care of the which, problem it, well, it which, reduces the risk of the problem uh, quite a little bit yeah. and uh, uh, you know there was there they, they had problems getting the, the corn rootworm genes accepted uh, having the farmers accept them and so they, they did some interesting marketing things and, and basically got you know with with the price and got it so that 
the corn rootworm gene was no more expensive with, or the corn wasn't really much more expensive with or without the corn rootworm gene. And so it just forced everybody, they said, well, we'll just, we'll buy that. And once that happened, then the demand was there. Well, then they just quit making anything that wasn't corn rootworm. And now that's all you have to choose from. And so now once they've got you planting that, then they can just continue to escalate the price um, because you because you don't have an option to go back to just corn borer protection. Yep. What would your advice be to to British and European farmers to go down this route or to? to... I I would not just from the standpoint that the the first few years it'll be cheap and economical, and uh, once everybody has switched to it, um, you'll lose your choices. Um, uh, you'll no longer have a choice to raise convention conventional products in the corn. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and you'll get yourself into a trap where you're paying royalty fees to companies that own traits and, and chemicals and, and they'll continue to raise those, those fees every year. Even if you didn't, didn't buy uh, glyphosate tolerant canola, somebody spilled some on the road or cross pollinated or did something and you'll end up with some in your field and, and, and uh, they'll own that and you won't be able to keep seeds back any longer. And run the risk of possibly going to court or yeah, oh, you, because you, you've stolen the trait yeah, and, and yeah, used not, it. Yeah, not possibly. You'll end up in court. <laughs> I'm now nearly at the end of my journey to investigate GM crops across America. It's been interesting. It's been a long journey. It's 5,000 miles. I've talked to a lot of farmers and a lot of other people. We saw the weed maize or corn as they call it here in their soya crop. We saw the weed soya in their maize crop because both were round up ready. I saw two farmers that were non-GM in soya beans, one of them also non-GM in corn. Um, both were paying less for their seed. Both were using less herbicide and at a lower cost. Time and time again, I've heard American farmers tell me that they are trapped in this GM crop system. Non-GM seeds are not readily available, and the few that are are older, lower yielding varieties. There is also the important fact that the genes that are modified in these crops are patented, so you cannot save your own seeds. As a number of farmers have discovered, if you are found to have patented genes in your crop, regardless of how they got there, or even if you didn't know they were there, if you have not paid the tech fee to the company who owns the patent, they can take legal action against you. So do American farmers grow these millions of acres of GM crops because the system works, or because there is little or no other choice? I think European farmers should look at what's happening here really hard before the decision's made as to whether we go down the same route. Lord, I'm going to find one name